by where we are. Exactly. Okay, so yesterday we looked at um, default judgment, summary judgment, and confession to judgment. Those are all shortcut ways to get a judgment without going right up until the trial. Right? Then we looked at the plea and we did the special pleas and then the plea, how to plea. And after that, we looked at um, what to do if a pleading is defective. You can accept or you can use the um, procedure um, in a rule 30, that is the irregular proceedings. Yeah, and I think that is where we are now. So um, the next thing that I'm going to, oh, before I get there, I just remembered um, last night that I omitted to say something. Um, if, uh, do I have any questions? with regards to yesterday? None. Okay, um, I omitted to tell you that when you do go and issue your... Um, Excuse me, ma'am, uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, I just want to confirm uh, the with regards to the dates, you said when, it, when, when, um, when the provision states that uh, it's one month, uh, it also includes uh, weekends and public holidays. Is that correct? Yes. If it doesn't say days, so many days. If it says one month, then then it is a calendar month. Okay. Um. So, so, so yeah. what I what I need clarification on, um, is 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 the fact that uh, if if the last day falls within a weekend, maybe falls within a Saturday, did you say that um? We need to we need to uh, consider only the next or the following court's day. Yes. Okay. And I, and, I, and, I, and I explain to you why because the last day is the last day in which you can do what you were yes, required yes. to do, and the courts are not open on a weekend, so it would be unfair of anybody to expect that if, if the last day falls on a day when the court is not open, that you had to do it on that day. It Thank just makes you. logical sense. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, and I just want to confirm, is, is that found in any provision or is that just a practice rule? Um, that is a practice rule, but um, it is how it is computed is found. It is in the rules. Um, let me get back to you on that one. I'll tell you exactly where, where um, to find it. It is in, in the Interpretation of Statutes Act. OK, I'll, I'll have a look. It's fine. In the interpretation, I think I put it up on a slide early on. It's in terms of Section 4 or Section 3, Section 3 of the Interpretation of Statutes Act. Just check that. Um, yeah. OK, thank you very much. OK, no problem. Anyone else with a question? Right. Um, Yes, um, oh, let me get back. When you go and issue your process at court, um, you are also together with your particulars of claim. And if you are for the defendant, together with your plea, when you go and file your plea, you must comply with Rule 41, capital A. Now, Rule 41, capital A is the, um, the rule that deals with mediation. Okay. So what is it that is expected of you to do? Um, you have to fill in a form, right? And this form is Form 27 to the Uniform Rules. And in that form, you must indicate that you have considered mediation. Basically, that is what, what you must say. You have considered mediation and that um, whether you think mediation is um, ca can, can happen in the matter or not, you you will indicate that so that your opponent knows that you're open to mediate this matter. Um, yeah, so basically mediation is a voluntary process. It con it requires the consent of both parties. Um, the mediator basically assists the parties to get to a um, to, to to come together. He facilitates discussions between the parties by identifying the issues, clarifying the issues. And, and seeing where people can, can compromise um, so that they can resolve this dispute out of court, right? But you cannot be forced to mediate. It's only that the rule, Rule 41A says that you have to at least consider it as an option. 
So you have to file that. And I know in Houting, if you don't file your Form 27, sorry, yeah, Form 27, um, they don't, they don't um, issue the matter. So, so they are strict in complying with it. Um, I, I've heard that in other divisions, they are not so strict in the, with the compliance, but it, it is compulsory. It is compulsory, so parties have to consider, um, it, and this is in the High Court, right? In the Magistrates Court, um, there's court ordered mediation, but in the High Court, parties can decide that they, they can say in that Form 27 that this matter cannot be settled outside of court, right? So, so this process um, requires a litigant to at least consider at the early stage that, that this can be done. And um, yeah, do, do I have any questions on that? None? Okay, so just remember that you must also do that when you go and issue your, your process. And then when you file the plea as the defendant, you must also complete um, Form 27. And then if the parties are both um, open to, to mediate, then a mediator must be appointed by the parties. And the two of them, um, they will pay for that mediator and they will try and mediate outside of the court before the matter. And, and if it's not successful, then they can then continue with the court process. That's basically what it is. And I think it is in your notes. Let's just see where they talk about it. Yep, I don't know. Did anybody come across it yet? Uh, page 41. Yeah. Sorry, 40, yeah. 43, 43, 43, 43, 40, sorry, 45, 45. Yeah. Okay, so so you are compelled to do it. And like I say, I do, I, I've heard in other, in some divisions, the courts are not so strict in, 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 in forcing people to comply, but I know in Hotting they are very strict. So you must just appoint a suitably qualified mediator and the, the cost, um, you, you must agree on the cost and who's going to pay and when and where the mediation is going to take place. And then there's um, timelines as to when it should happen. Um, it must be completed 30 days after the signing of a joint minute. And if it's not completed, then you, you go to court. So just read through that. Just know that that must be done. And there is a form. It is a form to the union. The form rules, it's form 27, that is the form that must be completed. So they ask certain questions and then you must just complete those questions. If you look at the uniform rules, which you all have with you, at form 27, you'll see what is required from you. Okay, so I've told you about that, so now I can move on. Um, rule 28 is what, the, what, what, what we are doing now and that is um an applicant so not the application a notice to amend i think yesterday somebody asked me how do you cure a defect if 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 um your if, if you've done something wrong like for example, like for example you did not attach a written contract to the to your um particulars of claim and how do you how do you cure that if your opponent did not um point it out to you and yes, done his next step, then, then that remedy is closed to him. And if you want to cure it, you can amend. In fact, anything that you have forgotten or that is wrong, you can amend your pleadings, right? And these are all the pleadings that you can amend. So simple summons, a declaration, combined summons, obviously a particular soft claim and a declaration is the same, a plea, claim in the reconvention, Request for further particulars for the purposes of the trial. Replication, rejoinder, all of those and documents that was filed. Okay, so now, what you do when you amend? We kind of get used to things like due terms. And I've had to do a massive, massive Liz Trust style due term on this case. What are we okay. talking about? We're talking that? about this one. <laughs> Opulent Musk. 
Yeah, I'm trying to. And massive, I'm massive warm welcome to John and Frank. You've been here before, you know how crazy I am, you know how big my collection of fragrances is, and you know I'm here to literally share these fragrances with you and try and inspire you to wear the good one each and every day. Right, okay. This fragrance costs me yeah. £16, eBay, 100 bill for the perfume. Yeah, I'm looking at the Please mute. Can you be mute the person who's speaking? Okay, thank you. I think it's muted. Right. Um, okay, so so this so what is seriously a nostril dilemma? He's not muted. Especially, especially if the video. Linda, please mute your mic. Can you, can, can the person who is not muted, can they mute the... No, it's not there. Go. Okay, um, I think that person is muted now. Okay, so, so I can't see who's on here because I've got the slides here that I'm reading from. So if anybody wants to ask a question, just let me know. Say, can I ask a question? Because I can't see if your hand is up. But I don't know why I only have this tonight, but that is how it is. Right, so what you do is um, Rule 28 deals with amendments. Now you will see that Rule 28 says that you must send a notice to amend to your opponent. Right? Now, in the notice to amend, it is it is just like the notice of exception. It's not a notice of motion. It's a notice to amend. And basically, you are informing your opponent that you intend to amend. OK, so whatever you are going to amend, you tell your opponent that you intend to amend that specific paragraph of a particular soft claim or of a plea or of the notice of motion. And then you tell them what it is that you're going to amend, how you're going to amend it. Um, somebody saying something? Hello? Okay, I can't hear. Is it Zanele? Yes, Yes, Zanele. Someone was asking in one of the groups um, if, if if there's a way to maybe amend or justify um, an affidavit or bail. bail uh, no. Okay. Let me. And a uh, what affidavit? Affidavit of bail. What? Yes. In the criminal matter. Okay, okay, we're busy with high court practice and we're busy with civil proceedings, but we also do affidavits. And I can tell you now, you don't amend an affidavit. Remember, an affidavit is evidence under oath. So whoever deposed to that affidavit, that person saw that the content is true. So if it, if something is, if there was a mistake which happens, then what you have to do is you have to then um, do a supplementary affidavit and correct it in that supplementary affidavit. Explain why that mistake happened and tell the court what is the correct state of affairs. Okay, so you don't amend, you don't do a notice to amend an affidavit. You can't amend an affidavit. You can amend pleadings and documents and all of it, but not an affidavit. So if you draft an affidavit and something is wrong, you have to file a supplementary affidavit. And if it, if we if and, and I'm not talking now about the bail because that is different, but it is still an affidavit, and you have to amend it by making a supplementary affidavit. But for the purposes of this course, if an affidavit um is incorrect, something incorrect is stated in there, and you want to fix it, what you have to do is you have to um. Bring an application to file a further affidavit because in applications you are only allowed to file three sets of affidavits. The founding affidavit by the applicant, the answering affidavit by the respondent, and then the applicant files another replying affidavit. After that, you can't file any further affidavits except with the leave of the court. So if you need to 
fix something and you need to file a further affidavit, you can't just file it and say, oh, I'm, I'm just fixing this and I'm fine. You have to first apply to the court. So that is another application, another notice of motion where the relief that you request is to, um, to file a supplementary affidavit. And in that affidavit attaching that application, you must explain why the court should allow you to file the further affidavit. But I suppose with a bail application, just to answer the question and not leave you hanging, you can just file a supplementary affidavit and then um, tell the court that, that whatever mistakes was in the first affidavit and, and, and convince the court that, yeah, that, that, that it should be allowed, the amendment should be allowed. Right, so um, you, send a, you send a notice to amend. Am I still sharing with you? Yeah, yes, you, send an, okay. yes, you send yes, a notice to amend. So in the notice to amend, you don't do the actual amendment. You refer to the paragraph. Say you want to amend paragraph one. You maybe um, have the name wrong. You said the name is um, Sharon where the name is Shirley. And you can say amend paragraph one by replacing the name Sharon with the name Shirley. That is how you do it. You just say what you're going to do that's a notice of intention to amend and then you state um if the defendant or if the um, plaintiff whoever is the opponent um have any objection to the amendment they must um, um file a written objection within 10 days of delivery of the notice so within 10 days of delivery of the notice they must file the objection if they don't object, then it is deemed that they have agreed to the amendment. And then you can file your amended. So if you have amended, you've added, um, you've added paragraphs or you've deleted paragraphs or you've you've changed it maybe in a plea, you have maybe um denied something and now you've found out that you should have admitted or you didn't know about it and information came to the fore and now you want to plead. So you would put that in. And if they don't object within 10 days, you file your amended plea or your amended particular soft claim. So in the tram lines, it will be the same thing with the, the same one as before, where the amendments affected. So you will say in the tram lines, amended particular soft claim or amended plea or first amended particular soft claim, because sometimes they go as third or fourth during the whole time. Remember, we wait long to get the court date and Parties can amend it as many times as, as they need to amend. Um, if, a, if your opponent objects to the amendment, then the court must decide whether he should allow you to amend. Okay. Then, uh, then you must lodge an application for leave to amend. If, if the opponent amends, then you apply to court for leave to amend. Somebody, can, can that person um, just put off your microphone, please? There's a disturbance. Somebody's busy with. Okay, it. I don't know who that is. Um. Okay, it's it went silent. Right. So then you um. You can then amend. No, the person objected, your opponent objected. Now you have to apply to court for leave to amend. And now the court must decide whether he will give you the amendment. Now, what, what, what are you going to argue in court if you want the amendment? Obviously, you must then demonstrate to the court in your application for amendment, then you must then why the amendment should be allowed. Your opponent um, who has objected, he can then argue that if the amendment is allowed, it's going to prejudice him. And if it's going to prejudice him and the prejudice cannot be remedied by maybe a cost order, then um, the court may not give it. It's up. It's in the court's discretion to allow an amendment then if your opponent don't agree. And if he convinces the court, persuades the court that the amendment is going to be to his prejudice and no um, cost order can remedy whatever prejudice is going to suffer. Say, for example, um, it's um, close to the trial. Say it's two weeks before the trial, three weeks before the trial, and you are now um, 
saying you in error you made an admission and it should have been a denial um your opponent did not prepare to prove that because remember everything that is in den that is denied is in dispute because if it was admitted then the opponent thought okay that the plaintiff would think that is admitted so i don't need to prove that i don't need to call witnesses and now all of a sudden close to the trial he sees but now i have to prove that and now the witnesses he must find the witnesses and he must find evidence maybe appoint experts or whatever so and, and by that he's prejudiced he's being prejudiced and um if if he's the case has to be postponed because of that, because it's going to need more time, then you will have to pay the wasted cost. That's if the court is going to allow the amendment. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, as if the court doesn't um, grant the amendment, then, um, then, then it, it, you can't amend. Right. So any party affected by an amendment can within 15 days um, make it, make the consequential adjustments to the document. Yeah. That what I want to tell you about um, interesting is rule 2810, sub rule 10. Irrespective of all of that and the times that you have to consider the amendment and to object, the court may at any stage before judgment grant leave to amend any pleading or document on such terms as the court um, deems necessary or deems fit. So what that means is that even while you are busy with the trial, remember, we do not have the element of surprise in, in, in our cases. We, we know more or less all the evidence and we know everything, but there is this gap where there can be a surprise. That is the witnesses that's going to give evidence, the lay witnesses. When they give evidence, we don't know. Sometimes they say things that, that we didn't even know, if, even if it is our witnesses. If a witness says something in court that needs, that, that would um, force you to change your pleadings, because remember the pleadings contains the facts. So if they say something different, they give evidence and you now see, but that is not what we pleaded. So we have to amend our pleading so that it can correspond with with our evidence then you can ask the court in the court that for um if you can amend your pleadings and the court can give you that um can can give you that right to amend it um your opponent can object also in court and 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 the court will again look at prejudice and um if, if there's no prejudice no real prejudice or if there's no amendment going to be needed and that the court can grant that amendment. So any time until before judgment, you can amend your pleadings. So so what happens in court for those of you who goes to court, you will see usually with, with claims for, for damages, sometimes during the trial or close to the trial, people have to amend the quantum because they've maybe claimed too little and now they have to increase the amount that they're claiming. So, so then they would... Um, would have to amend the prayers and then they apply for leave to amend the prayers and they can even do that in court if a witness now says no but the damages is more severe and whatever and and then maybe they claim 500,000 and the damages now that the witness is saying is 700,000 so you must now ask for that amendment and it can be done um do i have any questions on amendment None. Okay. Right. Third party procedure. Okay, now third party procedure. So, it's rule 13 that deals with third party. Okay. So, oh, is there a question? Sure. Yes. I just want to check. Are, are you uh, breaking up? Yes, I'm yes. saying. Just want to check something uh, uh, with regard to amendment. Uh, that uh, yes. the, it, uh, the way you are explaining it is that uh, it means that there's no need for me to first go to my opponent and ask that I want to amend, and the opponent agrees. Or if if then it does not agree, then I can go to court and bring an application for. Uh, for, for amendment. 
So as long as they don't uh, object within 15 days. Am I correct with that understanding? 10 days, within 10 days. OK, so you send a notice of your intention to amend and you say this is what you want to amend and they have 10 days in which to object in writing. And if, if, if they don't object, then it is deemed that they have agreed and then you can just go ahead and amend your documents at whatever you, you can file in the amended pages. If they do object, then you must go to court and do, not, do an application to amend. Yes. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Advocate. OK. Mm, uh, Advocate, yes. can I ask something? Yes. Um, I know that you are dealing with um, action proceedings currently, but I just I just want to find out if is it possible to amend uh, a notice of motion in in application yes. proceedings? Yes, because a notice of motion you can also um, you can also amend a notice of motion because that's not an affidavit. So you can you use the so same rule, you use the same rule. Well, same process on. Yeah, All you right, use the same you. rule. Don't I have it here. I don't have it here, but yes, you would use the same rule and you would um, amend your notice of motion. You would give a notice All of right. intention to amend the notice of motion and then amend it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Is that it? Yes, moving along to yes, third yes. party procedure. Yes, Oba King? Yes, I was saying oh. that's it. Moving <laughs> yeah, moving al uh, along to third party procedure. Now that is rule 13 that deals with third party procedure. Now for those of you who are as old as I am, you remember third party procedure as RAF procedures, but that, I'm not talking about that. This third party procedure is in terms of rule 13. Um, you use this procedure where the party in the action claims. Sorry where the party in the action claims that he is entitled in respect of any relief, sorry, claimed against him um, to a contribution or indemnification from a third party. That's when you would use the third party procedure, right? So for example, and I usually, when I explain this, I usually have a, um, A sketch, but let me try and let me just try and get the two vehicles on. Right. Okay, you see those two vehicles, right? Um, can you see it? Yes. OK, fine. Right now, um, this is now say the owner of the red vehicle sues the driver of the green vehicle for damages to the red vehicle, right? The owner of the red vehicle um, is not the driver of the red vehicle. Remember when we did local standard, we looked at this and I said only the owner suffers damages and not the driver, right? So the owner of the red vehicle sues the driver of the green vehicle because the driver of the green vehicle was negligent and he drove into him. Then the this driver of the green vehicle says, but your driver of the red vehicle, which you did not, you are not suing your driver of the vehicle, but that driver can contribute to whatever you are claiming from me because he was he or she was also negligent so i was not alone negligent okay that is when third party procedure comes in okay right so um let me just read on where any question or issue in the action okay it's the same the purpose of third party procedure is to avoid a multiplicity of actions and the rule is complementary to but that's not supersede the machinery laid down in section two of the Apportionment of Damages Act. Right now, if I begin with the Apportionment of Damages Act and I look at this example again. Now, if, if you apply the Apportionment of Damages Act, it will be as... 
Excuse me? Nobody else. Excuse me? Is there a question? Is there a question? No, it's okay. Is it nice? Can you just mute? Can you just mute, ma'am? I don't know who you are, but can you just mute, please? I think it's Leslie and Marcus. Leslie and Marcus, can you just mute? Oh, there. Right. Okay. Um. Back to this. Apportionment of damages. Let's for one moment imagine that these are both the owners of the vehicle. No, man, Leslyn Marshall. You are disturbing me. Leslyn. I can't, I can't mute because I don't have that um, power. I, I can't put people's mics off. I don't, uh, the mics don't appear next to them like yesterday. I could. Marcus. Leslie, please mute yourself. Leslie, mute. I don't think Leslie is listening. Listen, is not paying attention. Right. I want to go, I want to go back a step and first explain to you what the apportionment of damages act, um, what that means. So let's for a moment imagine that the owner of the red vehicle is also the driver of the red vehicle. Right? And the uh, and both of them or, or the green vehicle, it doesn't have to be the owner, it can still be the driver. But let's assume that. The driver of the red vehicle is also the owner of the red vehicle. And in his capacity as the one who suffered damages with Locust Stand, he now sues the green vehicle. What, what the guy um, in the green vehicle can then say is that I am not totally responsible for your damages. You have contributed to the damages. So then the, the yellow shirt is the plaintiff. The red car is the plaintiff. The green car is the defendant, right? They are in court. The red car proves damages um, of a thousand rand, right? The court then, after listening to the ev evidence, says your damages, your quantum of your damages is a thousand rand, but the green car is only responsible for 70% of your damages. 30% of the damages is your own fault. You could have avoided the, the accident. You could have mitigated your loss. You could have done something, swerved away, something you could have done. So 30% green car is only liable for 70%. That then means that of the 1,000 rand damages that you suffered, the green car must only pay you 700 rand, 70%. You must pay the 30 Percent yourself, the 300 rand yourself. Okay, that is apportionment of damages when the court apportioned damages to the parties. Right now, the third party procedure is complemented to that, but it does not supersede, it does not substitute for that. Right, the third party procedure is where the driver of the vehicle of the red vehicle is not the owner, the owner is somebody totally different. So that owner did not contribute to his own damage. Say, for example, it was this. They are mother and daughter. So the mother is not going to sue her own daughter as a defendant, first defendant and second defendant, and say that they are jointly and severally liable for the damages to her vehicle. She only sues the driver of the green vehicle. The green vehicle owner then serves a third party notice on the driver of the red vehicle and say, you can indemnify me or you can contribute um, to the relief that is claimed against me. OK, so then, OK, so so I'm going to leave that sketch now and I'm going to go to. Um, sorry, I'm just going to go back to the party notice. Sorry, just deal with me.
I could have done this in the side of a tape. Just keep Right, so the, um, what happens is now, then all the papers are served on the third party. All the pleadings are then served on the third party. So all the pleadings will be served on the, 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 the driver. Um, and then in the notice, the third party notice, the nature and the grounds of the claim of the party issuing it. He sets out the question or issue that has to be determined in court. So who is negligent? That will be the question. And, and what is the damages and the relief or the remedy claim, right? And the notice must be served on the third party before the close of pleadings. If the pleadings have closed and you want to serve a third party notice on someone, then you have to um, apply to the court to serve the third party notice, right? There's an example of a third party notice on page 249, right? Okay, so now... The third party then participates in the matter as if the third party is a defendant because he can also now adduce evidence um, to say what his role was, call witnesses and all of that. Right. But this is the this is where it is different. When the court makes a judgment, no judgment sounding in money is can be sought against the third party. All that can be sought is an apportionment of fault in the form of a declaratory order. So the court can only make a declaratory order against the third party and not say that the third party must pay the plaintiff. Right, so the court will say the owner of the red vehicle has suffered a thousand rand damages. The court can say the defendant, the green car, is 70% responsible and the driver of the red car, the daughter of, of the owner, is 30% responsible. But the court doesn't say that the driver of the yellow of the red car must pay because they don't stand against each other. There's no list between them. They are not plaintiff and defendant. Remember, the defendant served a third party notice on, on the driver who wasn't sued. He said, you can indemnify me, you can contribute. So the court makes no judgment sounding in money, but makes a declaratory order. But what happens is, and this is where it becomes, yeah, this is where people are going to start and ask me questions. The defendant must pay the amount of money that was proved. And the defendant has a declaratory order and then can the defendant can then go after the driver and claim his money back. From the driver, he's, he's yeah. That's third party procedure. So that and it's to avoid a multiplicity of actions, so that there's not another action against against the defendant. Um, the evidence has already been heard, and the court has established and the court has declared that the driver of the red vehicle is thirty percent responsible, but the owner will get his. 100% from the defendant and the defendant will have to go off to the third party with a declaratory order to get his money that he paid to the plaintiff. Okay, that's third party procedure. Do I have any questions? Advocate, please could you explain more on the third party? How does the third party come in the accident, please? I lost my way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm um, just picture this: the two vehicles, the green vehicle and the red vehicle, right? Yes. The owner of the red vehicle is not the driver. It can be say say it's the girlfriend is the owner and the boyfriend was driving. The girlfriend sues the driver of the green vehicle for the damages to the red to the red car right but he doesn't join his girlfriend because you're not going to sue your girlfriend in court and say you both were responsible and you both must pay me 
He sues the defendant. The defendant says, no, but there is somebody who can contribute or indemnify me. And he serves a third party notice then on the driver. The driver is not the party, but he brings the driver in by via a third party notice. Then the driver can participate, lead, adduce evidence, and the court then makes a decision. But the court does not make a decision to say that the driver of the vehicle, of the red vehicle, must pay an amount. It only declares he's present that he is responsible for the damages to the vehicle. Which, which driver is brought in? Which, which among the two drivers? The right. Green the green the... vehicle is a defendant. Yeah. The green vehicle is a defendant and the owner of the red vehicle, who was not the driver at the time of the collision, is mm. the plaintiff. Yeah. So the plaintiff wasn't part of the accident, but he suffered damages to his car. His girlfriend drove the car or his boyf boyfriend drove the car. Mm. He's sues the driver of the other vehicle who collided with his girlfriend for the damages to his car. That driver says, I didn't cause that damages alone. The driver of your vehicle is party to blame. And then he serves a third party notice on that person. Okay. Did, did you understand now how the third party comes in the fray? Yeah, I understand now. <laughs> Advocate, can I just ask a question? Yes, Louis, Pretorius. Um, you were saying that uh, after the uh, after the 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 the, the, the court has uh, actually made an order, and uh, that the the owner of the green car That's utilizing the utilizing the declaratory order can and go after option. the. The, the driver, driver of the red car. Does that mean yes. that brand new action proceedings will will ensue? That is that is the whole purpose of, of third party procedure to avoid a multiplicity of, of 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 actions. Already, all the evidence has been heard. There's already a declaratory order. You can now just use that and execute on that declaratory order against the driver. But then he stands as um, as plaintiff towards the driver, but oh, they don't have to have the whole action procedure because already it's been in court. The court has already said what percentage of damages that person ca caused. It's just in that particular procedure before the court, the court doesn't say that that person must pay the plaintiff 30 percent. It just says you are responsible for 30% of the damages, but the court doesn't make an order sounding in money to say you, because remember he is not a defendant. Although he, in the proceedings, he can act as a defendant. He's not a defendant. That because the case is between the plaintiff and the defendant. Okay. I don't know, um, Mr. Pretorius, if are you, are you clear on that, Lloyd? Is it because he's not a yeah, thank you. Okay. Advocate yeah. is because he's not the owner of the vehicle then. That is why the declaratory order will not have any effect on him. Who, who is who is him that we are referring to, I mean, sir? I mean, I mean the the girlfriend. Yeah, she's not the owner of the vehicle, but the declaratory order says that she's 30% drove. She's 30% responsible for her boyfriend's mm. damages. But the boyfriend mm. didn't sue her. The boyfriend sued mm. the other guy. But that is why he brought her in so that the court can already determine what of the damages is responsible so that when he gets the declaratory order, he, the defendant, can go after, after with that declaratory order and say, now you mm. must pay me because he had to pay the plaintiff for all the damages, hmm. because they are in a sense, in, in essence, they are joint wrongdoers. Yes, yeah. And yeah. when there's joint wrongdoers, it's always the one paying the other one to be absolved. But he has a declaratory order to say, I paid already, but the court he couldn't make a, an order sounding in money against you, but I want to claim back from you what I paid. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank okay. you. Okay. Sure. Sorry, does that mean that uh, there will be new, there will be new uh, proceedings then in terms of claiming the money? It's not a new, it's not a new um, summons and that he already has an order of the court, a declaratory order. You can execute on that declaratory order, but it is against the, the person who owes him that money that he okay. has already paid. Okay. That is the whole purpose is to avoid that you have more cases because it is the same. The evidence has already been heard and the evidence has already been um, analyzed and the judgment has already been made. So you don't start over. And you don't have to execute on that declaratory order, but you can if you want to. Thank you. Right. If there's no more questions, I'm going to be moving on. Yes, um, advocate, uh, just one more question. Um, so, sure. yes, um, as, a, as a plaintiff, um, and you are not, uh, you are the owner of the car, obviously, but not the driver at the time of the accident. So now, um, can you just simply um, cite the, um, the driver of the car at the time of the accident, as well as the defendant, and they'll be jointly. You separate. can. You can. But I mean, if you choose not to, which some people would not do, you can. You can't. Okay. If that was hap if that happened, then the defendant didn't have to ser a serve a, uh, a summons. Uh, sorry, a serve a third party notice on the driver. The driver, yes. But you can't also say that there's a non-joinder that that person have it because that person don't have a direct and substantial interest in the relief claim. That that would be the reason why you would join a party because his rights is going to be affected by the outcome because the relief is not against him. That person is not in the matter. So you bring him in as a defendant because you say he can contribute to the relief claim or indemnify me. Do you and, see? And of course that would. Um do away with the third party claim. There won't be a need for that. What third party claim is this? No, I mean um when when the court makes an order. Oh um yeah. there won't be a need for for now the the defendant. New a new a new case, yeah. And then the and how is the defendant in any event going to get the plaintiff to to give evidence in his matter? No, I hear you. Because evidence has already now been heard in this one matter, and then he's got the declaratory order. He can now execute against the third party on that. No, it's clear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, there was a. a, a let me just check yes. again. Yes. Yes. Um, Claudia. I have a question. Um, my question is, uh, I would like to make an example with um, probably the road accident one, where there's two drivers that are involved in an accident, but they claim... Okay, are you speaking too fast and too soft? Can you just... Um, um, I, I can't follow you. You said there's two drivers? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. I want to make. Uh, I want to ask based to uh, road accident fund. In the case where marriage was settled, uh, and there was apportionment, probably let's say sixty forty, uh, yes. to your claimant. Uh, can you can, can you therefore uh, that forty percent that was apportioned uh, take it as a declaration? Of, Order for the other client that was involved in the accident, if it is for another party, or is also your client? No, no. Um, look here, yeah, you. Um, when a person is claiming for bodily injuries, you claim from the road accident fund as a defendant, because all the drivers in South Africa are covered by the road accident fund. We contribute by. Um, a portion of the petrol goes to of our petrol money goes to the road accident fund. We are all insured drivers. So if we cause an accident and somebody suffers bodily injuries, then they sue the road accident fund, the insurer. We are the insured drivers. 
So if if in that case, if if merits has been settled, they determine who was more negligent. It's got nothing to do. I'm talking here about the damage to the vehicle. The owner suffered damage to the vehicle. Yeah, um, you don't sue people in South Africa for bodily injuries sustained in a motor vehicle accident because all of us are covered. Um, Claudia of Mochelo, did you hear that? Uh, yes, I did, but I was asking in relation to the fact of... Uh, no, there's not a declaratory order control. that you can go. That That is where the drivers are. If, if the court says that the the plaintiff is um 60, um, is 40 percent responsible for his own damage, then that is the apportionment of damages act that I explained to you beforehand. Then I am responsible oh. for 40 percent of my own damages. So if I prove a million rand damages, then I can only get 600 rand from the defendant because I am responsible for the 40 percent of my own damage. That is the apportionment of damages act. That oh, is not right. the third Thank party you. that is in that is uh, that is involved there. It's the yeah. And the defendant um, in, in, in the road accident fund matters, the defendant is the road accident fund and the defendant is all of the insured drivers are covered by the road accident fund. And that is only, but you don't sue for the road accident fund for damages to a vehicle. It is only for bodily injuries that you can sue um, the road accident fund. Right, okay. So sure. You said something. Right. You so, um, sorry, ma'am. You, you said you can sue. Just say road that accident. again. You said you can sue road accident fund for for you the break, damage. You break up. I say. I said what? You can sue road accident fund for for uh, damages what? to your vehicle. No, you can't. Only for bodily injuries. Okay. Thank you, noted. You can't sue the road accident fund for damages to your vehicle. You yes, sue for bodily injuries. It's for bodily injuries, psychological or bodily injuries to the body. Yeah. Okay. Not not okay. for the okay. vehicle damages. Sue All right, thank the person that is a, that is between the, the parties. All right, thank you. So this collision that I was talking about is the damage to the vehicle. It wasn't for personal injuries. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. right they... Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. I, I don't know if it's from my side or is it if it's from or if it's from your side, but it's a very that was a very bad connection. That's why I'm asking if you can hear me. Okay. Um, yes, clearly. Good. Right. So um, that is third party procedure. Unless there's no more questions, I'm moving on. We, we now come to the stage where the pleadings are closed. Okay. It's also referred to as litus contestatio. Now, Rule 29 of the Uniform Rules deals with close of pleadings. Right? And Rule 29, it says exactly what I say here. If any of the parties joined issue without alleging any new matter and without adding any further pleadings, then the pleadings are closed. If the last day allowed for filing of a replication or a subsequent pleading has elapsed and it has not been filed, if the parties agree in writing that the pleadings are closed and such agreement is filed with the registrar, and if the parties are unable to agree as to the close of pleadings and the court upon the application of a party declare them closed. So those in those four instances, the pleadings are closed. OK, so if with a fluxion of time, pleadings are where parties can't agree when the pleadings was closed. And this becomes important and I'm going to tell you why it becomes important. Um, if parties cannot agree when the pleadings close and then they approach the court, you can see the last one. If the parties are unable to agree as to the close of pleadings and if and the court is then approached um, and then the court declares it closed. And the reason for that is 
the plaintiff's rights are freezed as at that moment. So at the moment that the pleadings are closed, the plaintiff's rights are freezed. So a claim for pain and suffering is not transmissible on the death of the injured before the pleadings have closed, nor is it capable of being transferred by session before the pleadings have closed. OK, so a claim for pain and suffering is not transmissible on the death of the injured before the pleadings have closed. So you can understand that a plaintiff's attorneys will say the pleadings have closed if sorry, let me start over. You can understand that if the plaintiff should die at some point, that the plaintiff's attorneys would probably argue that the pleadings have already closed so that that whatever benefits can then be transmitted to the estate and the executor can stand instead of the plaintiff and the defendant will say no the pleadings did not close and then they would go to court and the court will have to determine whether the pleadings was closed actually there's a benefit in it for for the parties right so um that is why sometimes even though with the inflection of times we know that pleadings are closed but to determine the correct moment in the case where the plaintiff has died and the claim is for pain and suffering that is important okay any questions? So I can move on. Right, um, now we are finished now with the pleading it's stage. It's before that, okay. oh. Yes. Yeah, before that, if maybe, uh, you know, the pleadings are closed um, and then maybe following a pre-trial and so on, and then uh, you find that maybe one party was not represented and um, would not know, you know, as to it was not. Yes, and then and um, and then the the matter is 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 declared. Uh, closed. Yes, advocate. Yes, is there any recourse, you know, um, in that instance? I, I didn't get your, I didn't, okay, you say if the pleadings have closed and you find that, just just repeat that part, and you find that. And, and then, um, whereas, you know, maybe one of the parties was, was absent or didn't have any representation, didn't know of uh, of, of, of the proceedings, that, that, that came to the uh, conclusion that the, the matter is closed and ready for trial, you know, is there any um, remedy? I, I still don't get you. You say if the pleadings have closed and one of the parties what was not present at the time uh, on the date that uh, you, you know the pleadings were closed, you know, whereas they wanted to actually maybe they might have actually uh, intended uh, they to might file have certain what? they might have intended to file certain information that is to to file what to to, to file a, a, any pleadings. Um, you, you know, to, to further their cases. Um, and then. Sorry, but um, you're breaking up. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me now, now advocate? OK, let me, let, me, let me repeat to you. You say if the pleadings have closed and one of the parties were not present when the pleadings closed and he yeah. wanted to still file further pleadings and he didn't know that the pleadings have closed. Yes. Is that your question? That but the pleadings be. close with the effluxion of time, sir. Uh, it's not open just like that. If if the last day for filing a replication and a subsequent pleading has come and gone, then the pleadings are closed. So it's not that somebody can be caught off guard and say, OK, now you've declared the pleadings closed. By the effluxion of time, that is the first time when you can see that the pleadings have closed. Um, just look at it again. Um, if any of the parties joined issue without alleging any new matter and without any further pleadings, the pleadings have closed. If the last day allowed for filing of a replication or a subsequent pleading, that is that rejoinder, sir, rejoinder, rebutter or sir, rebutter, it has elapsed and it has not been filed, then the pleadings are closed. Now, I, I explained to you why the, it would be necessary for the parties to agree or, or approach the court. It is in that instance where the plaintiff has died 
and it's a claim for loss for pain and suffering and then the court has to step in to determine because the parties can't agree but usually if the last they allow for filing of a replication now a replication must be filed 15 days after the plea if that no replication is filed and the 15 days has passed then the pleadings is closed oh okay thank you very much okay Yes. Now, I, I, I just want to take that a bit further with you because I, 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 I'm trying to think why you would ask that. Um, just because the pleadings have closed, it doesn't mean you can't bring an app, a, a note. You can, can't amend the pleadings that you've already filed. Yes. Right. And if you didn't file your rep, you want to replicate, you want to file a replication and the 15 days has come and gone and the pleadings is now closed. If you want to file after that, the pleadings is closed, but if you want to file after that, you must bring an application for condemnation for the late filing of your application. And you can okay. bring that. For any of the rules that you didn't comply with, you must bring an application for the court to condone you not complying with the rules. And the court then will have to be persuaded that the reason why you didn't um, comply with the rules, with the times set in the rules, um, is a good reason and that you should be allowed to still file it, but you have and, and that your opponent is not going to suffer prejudice and also the reason for the delay, the length of the delay, any prejudice suffered, all of that issues must be addressed in your application for condemnation. And then also that you've got a good chance of success and then the court will can grant you that. Oh, but but okay. it can never happen that a pleadings close in your absence and you didn't know about it. You know about the times and if the time come and gone, pleadings have closed. Oh, OK, thank you very much. Advocate. OK, sure. Um, we now come to the stage um, where OK, so once the pleadings have closed, this is also what you have to do. You now have to enroll the matter. So um, I don't have a slide on this. I'm just speaking off the top of my head. You now have to um, collate the file, see that all the pleadings are in it. Paginate it and complete an index, and then you can enroll it. You can put it in the. You can enroll it for a court date, right? So that the pleadings have now closed, and now you can enroll the matter. Okay, you're not going to get the court date immediately, but you can already um, fill in the register or do if it's online. However, it's done, you would do that, right? Now we come to the stage of the practical arrangements, the discovery, and after that. OK, and you get all of these notices and discovery in the High Court is dealt with in, uh, in Rule 35. But before I'm going to go into Rule 35, I'm going to tell you about Rule 37 that says that in each and every matter you must discover even if you were not called upon to discover. So we call that um, automatic discovery. I'll go back to the previous slide now. So um, in terms of Rule 37.1, there's an obligation on all parties to make discovery in all the cases, even if the other party does not require it, and the affidavit must be filed even if there are no documents to discover. And that is 15 days after you receive notice of a trial date. So in each and every matter you must discover. The, when the um, discovery process starts, that is when your parties can ask each other, they call on each other, they send notices to their opponent to say, can you please discover? But if that didn't happen and there was no discovery, once you receive the trial date, you are obliged to file a note, a, a discovery affidavit to say um, what documents you have. And if you, even if you don't have documents, you must say that in the affidavit. Okay. The basic rule for discovery is that no party may for any purpose use a document at a trial if the document has not been previously disclosed. Um, your opponent may use it. So if you were supposed to have discovered a document and you did not, you cannot use it at the trial, but your opponent may use it. That is the general rule of discovery. Now, what is discovery? Discovery is not you giving all the documents to your opponent. That, that is not what it is. Once you receive the notice of discovery, 
and that is in terms of Rule 35 one where your opponent will say, um, be pleased to take notice that you are required to discover all documents and tape recordings um, relevant that you have or had that is relevant to the case. Basically, that's what it says. Now, once you receive that notice, then you are obliged to deliver a discovery affidavit. Now, the discovery affidavit has two schedules, Schedule 1 and Schedule 2. In Schedule 1, you'll have a list of documents and tape recordings that is in your possession. And Schedule 1 consists of two parts, Part 1 and Part 2. And um, the parts, Part 1, is documents that the other party is entitled to inspect. And part two is um, documents that are privileged. Like um, letters between attorney and client. Now you will see a discovery affidavit. This is now the answer to a discovery notice. When you receive a notice, you must file a discovery affidavit. And you will list all the documents that you had that, that is relevant to the trial, right? Schedule two is a list of documents that you once had but doesn't have anymore. If you look on page 250, you'll see a discovery affidavit. 250 of your manual. You'll see a discovery affidavit and what it looks like. So it has the schedules and you will list all the documents that is relevant to the trial. Everything that you know of that is relevant, you list it. And you can you even list documents that your opponent may not see that is privileged. Remember, if you do not discover a document, you won't be allowed to use it at the trial. Right. If um, now once you have done your discovery, effort, once you have received a discovery affidavit and you go through the discovery affidavit and you see the list of the documents that your opponent has. You uh, and you, you consult with your client and your client tells you, but he, um, they didn't discover everything. There's still certain documents outstanding. Provided that you do know what documents are outstanding. You can file a, a notice in terms of Rule 35.3 that ask for better discovery. And better discovery, you must specify what document is not disclosed. So if you know, say it's a, it's, it's a parties are married in community of property and there's a joint estate and maybe there's bank accounts and houses and properties that is not on the discovery affidavit um deed of sale or whatever um and your client tells you look this and this is not mentioned then you must specify look you must discover this also okay so you must specify if you ask for better discovery what documents is not disclosed you can't just say you didn't discover everything and go on a fishing expedition and see what what comes out. You must be specific as to what is not disclosed, right? And obviously the documents that you want to be disclosed must be relevant to the case. Okay? It can't be irrelevant stuff that you want documents of. It must be relevant to the cause of action. So you can ask for better discovery. Right now you have the list of, of the documents um, relevant to the trial that your opponent has in their position. And, and remember, send the notice to discover the parties send each other notices to discover so it can be the plaintiff and, and the defendant anyone can want to discover and then you are obliged to file a discovery affidavit within 20 days after having received the notice now once you have received the notice you can send a further notice to inspect right this notice allows you to inspect and make copies of document listed in the schedule attached to the discovery affidavit Maybe you don't want to inspect each and every document, but there are some documents that you want to have a look at. So if you send a notice to inspect, they will allow you to make copies. These days they don't. Um, parties hardly go to the other party's office and um, go and make copies. They usually would scan it in and send it to you. But yeah, so it allows you to do that. You send a notice to inspect. What, what documents do you want to look at? that they have that is relevant. Right. And remember, if you send any of these notices to your opponent, which I just him to do what you ask, and can compel him, you send a notice to compel him, and then um, he has to go to court, and the court will then make an order, or if he doesn't go, it can be unopposed, the court will make an order as to when he should discover, and if he doesn't, you can have the matter set, set down, 
and have the claim dismissed if he doesn't comply with the rules or his, can, his defense can be struck out. So you can compel your opponent to discover, right? And there can also be a special cost order if a person um, didn't discover when he was supposed to and now opponent is forced to go to court to get him to discover, the court can make a special cost order, which means a punitive cost order, right? You can also send a notice to specify to your opponent, that is in terms of Rule 35.8. This notice obliges the other side to list all the documents and tape recordings that they intend to use at the trial. So you have all the documents that is relevant that they had, that is in the discovery affidavit. You can send to inspect, so you can look at specific documents, and then you can ask what, which of these documents that you've discovered are you going to use. This, this then gives you a good idea how the other side intend to talk, conduct the case. Because now they must tell you, I'm going to use X, the document two, three, four, whatever. They're not necessarily going to use all the documents, but they've just discovered all the documents. In case they want to use one of those documents that they maybe didn't specify, they can. Um, yeah. You can also to them. This notice um, asks them to bring one of the documents, one or more of the documents that they have discovered to bring it to court when the trial, during the trial. This will enable you to submit that document or tape recording to the court as evidence in your case. Now, when I say submit the document as evidence, it means that you do not have to prove that the document um, is original and authentic. You may simply hand it into evidence. This is what this uh, sorry, um, sorry, is. Advocate. Uh, it seems as if you're breaking the up. effect of that. So you send it to the uh, advocate. Yes. Excuse me. It seems Am I breaking? Break, yes, I can, can hear you. Yes, I Am I breaking up? Yes. I'm so sorry. I wasn't aware of it. Um, not. Where did I break up? Can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly now? Not. Yes, now we can hear you. Hello. Can you? Can, I'm so sorry. I'm. Um, where yeah, did you, where did I? When, when, where did we? Up. Where were we when we when I broke up? Um, I'm sure, still we, breaking up. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, Okay, is there a lot that you have missed, sir? Advocate, this might be an opportune time for a break. I can't hear you. In order for you to sort out that, um, the breaking yes, up. Let me, let me go out and come back in again. So let's break until seven and I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. Okay, um, let me go out and come back in.
<clears throat> Are we on break, guys? I can't hear anything. I just came back. I was thrown out. Yes, we are on break until seven o'clock. We are back at seven. Yes, we are on break. Advocate was breaking down when she was presenting, so she gave us a break so that she can sort herself out. Come back again. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now I realize why I was thrown. I was off. Okay, thank you.
I know I said I was going to get back at seven, but I just want to check if if you those that are here, can you hear me clearly? Yes, My, yes, you are now. Yes, you can. yes, we can, Prof. Okay. Yes, you can. Thank you yes, very you much. You okay. Yeah, no, okay. So, thank you. Sure. See you at seven, because I know some people are coming back at seven. I don't want to be unfair towards them. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, I'm back. Um, just tell me, um, where, where did we lose? Where did you lose me previously? Do you know? Can you remember? Love to speak. Excuse no, me. We didn't. We didn't lose you. Uh, we, in actual fact, it was just a question of the echo that was coming out. Uh, oh. But otherwise, we could actually capture, um, you, you know, the, the, the gist of what you're uh, okay. teaching, yes. Okay, so I will then just continue from where, um, from where I stopped. I think it was here. Um, you send a notice to specify that obliges the other side to list the documents um, that they intend to, to use at the trial and a notice to produce where they have to bring their documents to court so that you do not have to prove the documents with the tape recording. 
um, what that means is um, I don't. Um, when we in court, if you are going to use a document as part of your evidence, you know that you have to prove the document. Before you can ask a witness questions on that document, you must prove that document. Now, what that means is that you must call the writer of that document and then present evidence to the circumstances under which that document was drafted. Um, so you would say, did you draft the document? Is that your handwriting? Were you, did you know um, what you were doing? When were you doing it and what and, and all of that? You have to prove that the document is authentic. But if you send a notice to produce to your opponent to bring one or more of their documents that they have discovered to court because you want to use it, then you don't have to go through that. So that um, saves time. You simply hand the document up to evidence. You don't have to call the writer of the document. It's one of their documents that they've discovered. So it eliminates that part if you send a notice to produce. If you send a notice to admit to your opponent, so you request the other side to admit one of your documents. Um, if, if they admit um, one or more of your documents, again, you do not have to prove that it is the original document and that it is authentic. You will then may simply hand it into evidence. This is now if they have admitted the document. This procedure saves costs because it's one less witness that you have to that you have to call. It saves time. Right now, let me just pause here for a moment and and just explain around admit. Now, the notice to admit a document of you is not you're not asking your opponent to admit the evidence that the document contains. That is not what you're asking your opponent. When you send a notice to admit, he must admit that the document is what it is, what it purports to be. If it's an invoice um, from a certain shop, then if he admits it, he admits it's an invoice from the shop. He doesn't admit that what is written in the invoice is correct and he's not going to cross examine and he believes all that. He only admits that the document is what it's purports to be and you don't have to prove the authenticity of the document. But that does not necessarily mean that he agrees with the contents of the document. I just wanted to make that clear when I say notice to admit because it doesn't mean if you admit a document, you admit that what is in the document is correct. You just admit that the document is what you say the document is. OK, if, if it's a letter that was written to somebody. Um, you ask him to admit that document and he admits it. You don't have to call the writer of that letter, but you can add it uh, into evidence and you can lead evidence on it. You don't have to prove that the document is authentic. You can still cross examine and challenge the contents of that document. Right, then, um, yeah, that is that is um, discovery. Do I have any questions on that? Oh, and another thing that I didn't mention before I forget. Um, rule 35 sub rule 14. Um, you can send a notice to your um, to your opponent if you need him to admit uh, not to admit <laughs> if you need them to um, give you a document that they have referred to in the pleading. Like, for example, in the particulars of claim or in a plea, a document is referred to. Now, remember, we only plead facts. We don't plead evidence. But if you need to see that document before you must plead, you are for the plaintiff. They refer to a document. And I'm not talking about the contract that was entered into between the parties that must be attached in any way. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about another document that they refer to. You and you need to see that document before you plea. In terms of Rule 3514, you can send them a notice before you plea so that they can give you that document. Yes, Cabello. Cabello, your hand was up. Yes, uh, the previous page that you had uh, indicated at the top thereof that uh, you are now speaking about uh, Rule 35, and then it says page 303 i don't know it's, is it a page 
Is it a pen no, from that is the, not that is that is that is a, that is not the, the this um this manual page three or three. Okay, no, the, because uh, I was confused oh. because our manuals don't, no. doesn't have them. Yeah, no. we don't. Your your, your manual go. It was the time when they still attach the rules to the documents to uh, to your notes, um, but oh. they don't do that anymore. So sorry, I must I must actually remove that. No, I'm clarified. Okay, no, fine. Um, what was I saying before that? I was talking about Rule thirty five fourteen. Right, let me just look at Rule 35.14 and just read it to you. Rule 35.14, those of you who have your thing. After appearance, um, this is what the rule says. After appearance to defend has been entered, any party to any action may, for purposes of pleading, require any other party to make available for inspection within five days a clearly specified document or tape recording in such party's position which is relevant to a reasonably anticipated issue in the action and to allow a copy of or transcription to be made thereof. Or state in writing within 10 days whether the party receiving the notice objects to the production of the document or tape recording and the grounds thereof. Or state on oath within 10 days that such document or tape recording is not in such party's possession and in such event to state its whereabouts is known. So, um, for the purposes, that is now before the close of pleadings, that is right at the beginning, if there's certain documents that you need because you want to plead and you want to use it and your opponent has it, you can request at that stage in terms of 3514. Okay. Right, so I'm moving on from... Moving on from the... Um, am I still sharing with you? Because I don't seem to know. No. Can you see, I don't see that. Yes, meet. Meet the five point nine. Yeah, five point nine. Okay, so I'm still sharing with you. It's just that I can't seem to find to find that. Um, that's fine. Um. Let me just quickly find it. Right, so um, that is now discovery. Then we come to this um, to rule thirty seven, which deals with pre trial conferences. There's a hand up. Advocate, there was a hand up from Connie. And Dion, Dion's hand is also up, yes. Okay, mine was a question relating to discovery to say if the opponent has voluntarily produced the document, do we still have to uh, discover the documents? Do they notice to discover the documents? Um, or can they admit the document if they voluntarily produce the document, made the documents available to us? Okay, I, I don't understand. Um, just you say they voluntarily made a document if, available if do to you be before you yes. send the notice. Yes, before I send the notice, the opponent produced the documents, certain documents which in any way I was going to request, but they have been made available to me. So can I still go ahead and do the discovery of documents to prove to court? That if you that you don't have to prove the authenticity of the document, I would do that just to cover myself. Okay, all right, thanks. Yes, I I, I would just send the notice, even though I already have it. I will just send the notice so that I can cover myself in, in, in case he says that um you didn't send the notice to produce. I, oh, I'm thanks. No yeah, time. I would send the notice oh, just thanks. to cover. And then there was another hand up. Yeah, uh, that was me. Yes. Advocate. Yes. I just want to get a relation between um, magistrate court and high court, and and uh, although okay. what we are talking about high court uh, civil procedure. 
But I want to take you back to rule three, subsection three, regarding better discovery. Um, can you relate it? Can um, you re I, I can't hear you anymore. Yes. 35.3. Subsection three, about better dis discovery. It would be rule 23. Yeah, rule. Three in the magistrates. Yeah. Rule that would be rule 23.3 in the match court. The match. Do you have the match court rules? I do have. 23. 23. Three. Three. Okay. Uh, but I want to take... That's I call discovery rules. That it was I want to take you back to the um, CPA. Um, that is exactly the same. Oh. Section 7 um, of the You're CPA. You're talking about... Uh, you said... 35.3 for better discovery, right? 35.3 for better discovery. Um, You're breaking. I'm breaking up. What is CPA now? Uh, I want to, uh, where you request the court for further and better particulars. Um, I can't section, hear in. You can't hear. I'll write it in the. What, the, you, what are you saying? I'm writing it in the chat box. Thank you, uh, Advocate. Okay. The class up. Thank you. I can proceed. Okay, I'll check the check. I'll check the chat box. Um, advocate, just uh, one question from my side. Yes. Um, it's with regards to, to to compel um the discovery of David. So mm -hmm. I just need to find out when you when you compel and the opponent the opponent fails to discover. Um now when you when you ask the court to dismiss their their defense or or their yes or their defense, um you don't need now to go uh, to trial. <laughs> In no, it, it is an application. There's actually an example of the application. I was just there now and I'm away, but there's an example in your notes of the whole application to dismiss the defense or to strike the defense um, as to what it must contain. It is on page 130 something. I'll just tell you now. It's on page 130. Yeah, I know. Um, you have to go, you don't have to go to trial. But if they don't discover, you can have it just because they did not discover when the court has, you first bring an application to compel. Then the court will give an, a date when they are now by court order, when they must now, comp when they are now compelled to discover. And if they still do not do that, then you can, um, Bring an applica then you can bring an application to have it set aside. And in your notes, it's not by discovery, but I've just read it. It's in your notes. Um, no. oh, yeah, fine. there is an example of an application exactly covering that, um, which is helpful. Yes, Sibanda? Yes, that was me. Yeah? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, Dion, you said you were High Court Rule 35.3 and Match Court Rule 23.3 relates about better discovery. Can one relate it to Section 87 of the CPA about further and better particulars? Are you talking about the Criminal Procedure Act, Dion? Um, the Criminal Procedure yeah. Act, um, when you ask for, for, for further particulars, that further particulars for the purposes of the trial, and that would be all the evidence that the state have. So it would be statements that the state um, gathered in their, in their investigation in the matter. So um, when you say better yes. discovery, um, the state is supposed to give you all the evidence that they have, that, is, that, that they have in the, in the matter. So the example that I don't know. Yeah. The example Make if my client has been pulled over at a roadblock and he's been tested and taken to hospital for blood sample, I can perhaps ask them for permission from a, 
a higher body who authorized that um, roadblock, which will, which will not be in their particulars. Okay, okay, I hear what you're saying. You you want to know, um, do you want to challenge the legitimacy of the roadblock? Is that your, your angle that you're taking? Yes. So that that, that relates to the better discovery or, or, or well, in, 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 um, in, 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 well, you you can say you you can say that you you can then specifically I don't know it 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 will probably fall under section eighty seven but as you say it won't be in the court docket but you say you want better discovery and I don't know um which specific um section of this criminal procedure act covers that but um you can say that you're challenging the legitimacy of the but how you yeah, are going I'm, to have to cross examine up in the about the, I have to authorize that, but uh, okay, fine. That was just uh, something crossing my I, mind. I hear but, what you're saying, but it's not a civil matter, so the civil rules don't apply there. But I and wanted I don't to. Think the, the Criminal Procedure Act has as a rule for better discovery because I mean you get the contents of the docket and that is what they're going to use. But as part of your defense, you want to say that the roadblock was not authorized. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. No, no, I, thank I think you. you can go and see the senior prosecutor and say that this is what 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 you want to challenge. Um, the roadblock wasn't authorized, and you you want um that, and you can challenge it in court, and then maybe the court can order that they give that information. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, we were okay. just uh, just something crossing my mind. So yeah, we... no fine. Is another you. hand up? I don't know whose hand it is, but I see there's a hand up. It's my advocate. Yes. Uh, I, it's just a, a clarity seeking question. Um, with sure. regards to um, the the notice um, to inspect, um, what's yes. the difference between that and the request for documents that you don't have uh, in terms of Rule 3514? I'm not sure what the actual difference is. The difference is the time when you can ask for 3514. 3514 you can ask when you receive a particular of claim and they are in possession of a document. You're not calling for them to discover everything that they had that is relevant. There's a specific document that you need that you want to use for plea and you, that you know they have. You can call for that document and it is at that stage. The pleadings haven't closed yet, but you're asking for discovery in terms of 3514 at that stage before you even plea. All right, thank you very much. Okay, that's that's the difference. Okay, I, any other questions? Yes, uh, advocate. On that, uh, just a follow up. Um, so can you ask for a discovery of any documents, or does it have to be a specific document, like before, no. um, actually the close of pleadings? before close of pleadings yes in terms it of it must be specific specific documents um I, it must be specific um before close of pleadings you mean the 3514 yes yeah look if the pleadings are not closed we, we're still busy establishing the fact and then after the close of pleading then you can ask for for all the documents that they have that is relevant uh, so i thought perhaps there were at least documents that you can ask um, if you need it, if you need it, you could ask a list of documents. If you need that document in yeah. order for you to, to to draft a pleading, it can be a, a, a plea or your replication. If you need it, that document, you could ask it in terms of the rule 3514 okay. before close of pleadings. This is due to prepare better. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is that it? Okay, then we come to Rule 36. Now, Rule 36 deals with um, preparation, um, when inspection of documents and, and all of that, um, examinations and expert evidence. If you're going to use experts to prove your case, um, there are certain rules that you have to follow before you can um, use this expert. Right. So Rule 36 deals with ins inspections, examinations and expert testimony. And the object of this rule is to enable your, um, the parties then to test the strength of the case um, in order to prepare for the trial. OK, 
So if you um if the case relates to um an object, then you should be given an opportunity to examine that object. So your in your expert witness should be given an opportunity to examine that object so that they can advise you. Say, for example, a car was faulty, burst into flames, and they claiming damages and say that the things wasn't it wasn't put together correctly and whatever manufacturers fault. Then they must make that vehicle available so that your experts can look at it and advise you on it. Okay? That's what Rule 36 deals with. Also, if it's a claim for bodily injuries, then the plaintiff who claims that he's been injured um, in, by whatever way, by the defendant or the defendant's servants, um, must make himself available to be examined by the experts of the defendant. So say, for example, a person is in a, say, a motor vehicle accident and he has a back injury. Now, um, he has an expert that says his back is injured and he won't be able to walk, he won't be able to work and all of that. Now that plaintiff must make himself available because the defendant will now appoint his own expert to examine and to give him advice. Is this not true? Is the prognosis true? Is the diagnosis true? And he may come to a different conclusion than the first expert. So. Um, Rule 36 deals with those issues. Right, um, I'm going to come back to, to, to the expert evidence um, as to how you do the notices and that. Um, I just want to, at this stage, um, deal with further particulars for the purposes of the trial. You um, can request your opponent also to give you further particulars if at this stage certain things came to light and you need more information that will help you to prepare better. You can send a request, but it mustn't be less than 20 days before the trial. Okay, 20 court days, but 20 days, not less than 20 days before the trial. You can ask further particulars. Um, you subpoena your witnesses, your lay witnesses. Um, you send a normal subpoena for a witness to come to court um, and um, a subpoena to custacum. Um, if you want the witness to come to court and to bring a document with to court. This is now if you did not use um, the, the the discovery process to get the document um, to be brought to court because the party is not in possession of the document, but somebody else whom you want to speak to that document is, possession of, is in possession of a document. You need to um, issue a subpoena to Kastekum. Right. So expert witnesses coming back to that. In terms of Rule 36.9, you deliver a notice to call the expert. If you are, appear for the plaintiff, it is not more than 30 days after the close of pleadings. 34 days after the close of pleadings, you must deliver a notice. In the notice, you will just say, be pleased to take notice that the plaintiff intend to call Dr. X, a neurosurgeon, to give evidence at the trial. That's all. You must just identify who you're going to call and what is his field of speciality. Right? Um, the defendant, not more than 60 days, must also send a notice of the intention to call experts. And however many, a notice for each expert. Then uh, defend, the plaintiff must not more than 90 days after the close of pleading. So that is 60 days after he served the notice. 60 court days after that, he must then deliver a summary of the evidence that the plaintiff is going to give. And then 120 days after the close of pleading, the defendant must give a summary of the evidence that his experts are going to give. Um, yeah, um, the rule um, actually encourages that when there are um, experts to be used in a trial, that the parties should endeavor to appoint a single expert. Um, parties don't in practice do that because you get plaintiff experts and you get defendant experts. Um, the one will say the person can never walk again and the other one will say the person can take a panado and it can run a marathon. So they are usually so far apart, um, but the court, I think it is encouraged in the rules that the party must appoint a single um, expert because the role of an expert is really to give an objective opinion to the court and to assist the court um, to find the truth, 
that is the the true role of an expert and it's not to to speak in the one or the other's favor but um we're not there yet but parties should endeavor to appoint a single joint expert um and um, if there's not a single expert of the same discipline and there are two say there's two orthopedic surgeons and both of them um have their own opinions as to what the prognosis is um the experts must get together and file a joint minute 20 days after the last filing of the reports so what do they mean by get together they would usually call each other on the phone or email each other they will read each other's report and then they will compile a joint minute they will then say how far they agree with each other and how far they still are in disagreement and then the court will know okay they are only disagreeing on this aspect so we will uh, we will only concentrate on that in court so what happens is that in the joint experts in the joint minute experts sometimes change their minds they might have said one thing in their original report and then when they meet up with the other expert of the same discipline and they talk about the matter they might come closer together and they might change their mind and say look but i don't agree with that or, or, or i agree with you i see now what you mean and then they close the gap further that is the per role purpose of a joint minute they close the gaps further and they come to agreement on certain issues and if there is still disagreement they would note that in the joint minute and sometimes they would then totally agree in the joint minutes then at the trial you don't even have to call them because there's no disagreement between the expert um witnesses yeah so they must file a joint minute um if there are two on opposing side of the same discipline so it it, it can't you can't have an occupational therapist on the one side do a joint minute with the orthopedic surgeon on the other side it must be two occupational therapists to a joint minute, two orthopedic surgeons to a joint minute. If there's only one, then that means that evidence is then uncontested because you didn't brief a expert in the similar um, discipline and then you agree with that expert. You could maybe challenge the basis of the expert's finding, but I mean the expert is the expert. So based on whose evidence are you going to challenge it except for the fact that the basis on this of his findings that means the information given to him by the client was wrong and that's why his findings is not to be believed you can challenge it on that basis but yeah it's a bit difficult if you don't have an expert in the same discipline are there any questions none so far i'm just checking in no Right. Um, if you are going to use photographs, um, yes, there is a hand, George Bonacqua. Sorry, I, do, I don't think I said that correct. But yes, sir, you may proceed, or madam. Yes, you may proceed with your question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, I, I can hear you. Oh, is, was that not the question? Was that and not up? Yes, it's up, ma'am. Okay, ask. Then. My question is, in the event of there not being any agreement whatsoever in terms of the expert evidence, what then happens? Because if it's a medical matter, judges or magistrates are not uh, skilled in that particular field. Well, then the two experts, um, they give evidence. They are then... Um, they are then giving the evidence in chief and they are cross-examined and the judge will then decide um, which, which ev what evidence he's going to accept and what evidence he's going to reject and he's going to give reasons for it. That is how we test the evidence in court. So then okay. both of them must come and give the evidence in court and the judge will then decide. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Any so other questions? I think, yes. advocate, uh, the court... Uh, can the court decide to go beyond these two expert witnesses since two of them cannot agree and call in an extra, you know, witness, expert witness? The court out of the court's own accord. I mean, the, can't the court? No, the, the court can't call another witness. The court don't call witnesses. 
The court mm -hmm. don't call um, witnesses in civil matters. The, co um, the court, um, yeah, expert witnesses need to be paid and the court don't appoint witnesses. So you can see by what time, 20, um, 60 days after close of pleadings and 90 days after close of pleadings, you must have already secured your expert witnesses. So the court don't, the court will listen to the evidence and decide what who is going to accept and who is going to reject. So the court will say this expert says that, but and that expert says this, but I accept this expert because then the court will look at other corroboratory evidence of other experts and of the facts and then and analyze the facts as courts do. Mm. Okay. Because that is why we have court cases where experts disagree all the time and the court mm. must decide to reject someone and to accept other evidence. Experts disagree all the time, every day in court. It's not that mm. they always come to an agreement. Sometimes experts, um, it's believed that sometimes experts bully each other because sometimes they are in the same discipline, but maybe the one, they know each other and maybe the one is scared of the other one, or it was his professor at university and now they're both experts and then he convinces him to come to that side. Or yeah, or some, there's all of these little things, but experts are supposed to give objective evidence. But sometimes mm. the one will say, this is what happened. The operation wasn't done properly and the other one will say no, but there can be another reason why we have this consequence. It's not necessarily because of the operation. The court must then hear and the court must then look at the evidence as a whole and decide what mm -hmm. evidence is going to accept and what evidence is going to reject. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Any other questions? Right. If you are going to use photographs um, and or plans or diagrams, because sometimes when you call a witness and you want to demonstrate something to the court, you do it with reference to a photo or with reference to a plan that has been drawn or a diagram. Now, if you want to use that, 60 days after the close of pleadings, you must give notice of your intention to use such plans, diagrams, models, or photographs. And then the other party then can inspect it and he can admit such. Again, this admit doesn't mean that he say, this is evidence, I admit the evidence thereof. He just admit that this is a diagram of that place, or this is a model of the car, the small model of that, or this is a photo of that, that is what admit means, not he admits what the evidence. So if he doesn't admit the, the um, plan, um, diagram, model or photograph within 10 days, you can still use it because you've given notice, but then you have to prove that. So if it is a plan that has been drawn, say it was an, a motor vehicle accident and a policeman drew, drew a plan of the where the vehicles was after the accident, that accident plan that they do on the accident report. So you call the policeman and you have to then explain under what circumstances he drew it and all of that. If you're, That is if your opponent doesn't want to admit that that is the plan that was drawn. Okay, so he will come and say, this is what he's done and the circumstances under which, or if a photograph was taken, um, if your opponent doesn't want to admit the photograph, you can still use it, but you have to then prove the photograph. So you have to call the photographer who's going to say, I was taking the photo, it is of that, that road, the corner of that road, and it was taken on that day. Information like that. So um, if you did not um, give notice that you're going to use any of those plans, diagrams, photos, and monograph, um, photographs and models of things, if you did not give notice, then you are not allowed to use it. So you can't just grab out photos, call your witness and say, look at this photograph. Your opponent will get up and say, but I didn't see this photograph. So then you can't use it. Then you must ask the court for leave. And if the, the opponent is obviously going to object if you didn't give them notice before. And because remember, it is unfair towards your opponent because he must be able to look at that photograph beforehand and to, to, to um, show it to his witnesses and ask their opinions and what is this and where is this so that he can prepare proper cross-examination on it. Or is this the place? And they might say, look, that building that is there now, it wasn't there five years ago when the accident happened. So stuff like that. 
So if you just come and surprise them, they will object. And if, if the court, the court can disallow and not allow you to use it, or the court, um, if, if a postponement is occasioned by the fact that you did not comply with the rules and you have to pay the wasted costs. So that means your client. So you don't want those kind of things to happen because you don't want to run up unnecessary costs for your client. Okay, so you give notice and then, then you can use it. And um, the admission of it is just so that you don't have to prove it, that it's authentic and that it's original. Otherwise, you have to call that extra witness if your opponent didn't want to admit that. Okay, are there any questions? Yes, there's a question. You may ask. Can the inspection in loco also be used to verify some facts? Can? The inspection in loco. Yes, inspection in loco. Beforehand, you can de decide that you're going to, during the pre-trial conference, which we're coming to next, you decide um, that you're going to have an inspection in loco, and then the court and everyone go out, the same like you would in criminal matters. In civil matters, mm -hmm. it is also used. Um, provided that um, it's going to assist uh, and things are still the same, but I mean, that is for, for the evidence. Then if things are different and then you need evidence that it's not the same as as it was at the time when whatever happened there. But depending on the facts. But yes, inspection in loco can also happen in civil matters. Thank you very much, Advocate, about that. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Ivanda. Yes. yes, you want to use um, photographs and then you give um, that particular notice to your opponent. Yes. And um, let's say they don't inspect the photograph and can they object? Do they have to file the notice of objection? They have to file a notice so that they object to it. Because if, if 10 days have passed and they didn't object, then it's deemed that they have admitted it. And um, before objecting, is it the prerequisite that uh, they need to inspect first? Um, Physical. They must see a bit. Yeah, you, you would usually, if you, say, if, if you send them a notice um, that you're going to use the photos, you will include it. Or a plan, you will include it. But you say that they can inspect it, but you would usually include it. So you don't need to go to their offices and actually inspect it. Um, look, they they can can, but um, yeah, it's a plan or a diagram. It's not something that that you can't send to them. Um, yeah. but they can inspect it within uh, and in ten days must admit such. So you send it with your notice. I've got an ex uh, an example here of what the notice looks like. Yes. So um. This is just the question. You act for the plaintiff in an action where damages in for damages in the high court. You are in possession of five photographs which you wish to tender in evidence at the trial. Draft the necessary notice. Now, this notice is in terms of Rule um, 3610, right? So you can just say Rule 3610A. And this is just a tip for practice. Um, Whenever you are going to be required to draft notices, um, I know that we all look for precedents and we try and see how other people did it. If it's a problem and you can't um, find a precedent, look at the rule in terms of which you are drafting the notice. Remember, there was a lot of rules that I said you, you, you draft a notice, like exception, like amend, a notice of intention to amend. Look at the rule and then take that rule and just make it sound logical, make the necessary changes to meet your facts but include everything that is in the rules. So say, please take notice that the plaintiff and, and here intends that one it would be a mark to tender evidence at the trial of this five photographs depicting the damages to the motor vehicle or if it is body injuries or the scene of the collision and hereby offers inspection thereof to the defendant who is required to admit the same within 10 days after receipt of the notice. Okay, so that is um, basically you, you look at the rule. What does the rule say? And you fit the rule in there and it, you make it sound logical and that it makes sense. But you follow whatever is in the rule, the days and that, and that is your notice. Okay. 
Judicial case management is the next. Um, I, I, are there any, is there any questions on that? Or may I move on? Yes. Um, okay. You? Yes, I can hear you. Um, say, as you said, if the opposition objects to one of the photographs. Yes. Um, surely you've still got a right to present that photograph because it's no, you it have. adds value to your case. No, you, you no. I, I didn't say that if you objects, you can't. The what yeah, objects and means that you have to prove that the photograph is authentic okay, and original. Right. So you're going to have to call the photographer, but you can still use it because you have uh, given okay. notice. That is oh. what I mean by by that is where the objects and comes in. He might um want to ask that photographer, but this is not that scene that that they say it is. It's something different. You you know you want to challenge that 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 is authentic. But you can still use the photograph. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay. That, that, that also means that we can also bring our own uh, our own expert to to say that uh, the photograph was altered or something like that. Well, you you you're going to obviously um cross examine the witness who's coming to, to to give the evidence because you didn't admit the photograph so they call the witness and then you get a chance the witness will say this photo was taken there and then and then you will cross examine the witness and challenge the evidence by that and then if 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 needs be you can call a witness then just to also say but but I mean that would be after they have closed the case when you call your witnesses but you will challenge it because you will cross examine that witness uh. Anything else? Yes. Yes. I was going to ask if uh, you have filed that notice of intention to use some photos, and then the uh, opponent realizes, okay, now has she or he has no prima facie, that is me exactly, and and and, and then decide to uh, to uh, accept. Would you go and then apply for any judgment, like summary judgment or anything? Just just or say that again. Proceed. Okay, just to say the first part again, if the person objects if to the uh, photographs. No, no, if uh, that, that, that person realizes, okay, that is me and everything is fully evident, uh, I, I cannot deny that, uh, and then decide to uh, accept, what would be the procedure? Would apply for oh. any judgment or for anything? You know, you can, you, you, you can then discuss settlement of the matter. You can make them an offer to settle. And then you settle it, and then you can make the the settlement and order of court. If 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 you don't want to go further, you with your defence of the case or, or or with the case itself, then um if if it's the plaintiff, you can withdraw, and if you withdraw, you must also tender the wasted cost, or if it's the defendant, you can make an offer to settle. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right. Um, judicial case management, Rule 37, Capital A, deals with judicial case management. So, um, any time after the notice of intention to defend, the court, the case can be managed by by a judge. That's what judicial case management means. It means that the case is put before a judge, and the judge from there on manage the case. Um, and usually, this happens. Um, if you want to, you've enrolled the matter, the pleadings have closed, you enrolled the matter, and now you want to get a court date. You want the registrar to allocate a court date. Now, before the courts grant you a court date, the matter is then set down for judicial case management because a judge will now look at the file and make sure that everything is in order in the file. So you appear before the judge, the parties, and the judge will ask certain questions. Is as discovery is all of that there? Is everything been done? Expert witnesses, expert notices, joint minutes of the experts. All of that is anything still outstanding? Is anybody still going to amend? He's going to check all of that, and then you, your purpose at that stage, if you for the plaintiff you want to date, you would then um have the matter, say the matter is ripe for trial and ready for trial. And if the court then feel, um, agrees that the matter is ready for trial and the defendant also, everybody agrees that the matter is ready for trial, the court will then issue a certificate of readiness, of trial readiness, and then the registrar will then give it a court date. 
because if the matter is not totally ready, there's still things outstanding, parties didn't discover when they had to, et cetera, et cetera, then um, the court wouldn't give a court date. Um, this doesn't mean that the defendant can now keep the plaintiff hostage in getting his case before the court. If the defendant is willful in not, in not um, cooperating, there is the interlocutory procedures application to compel to do certain things. And if the defendant still doesn't do what he's supposed to do, the matter can then still be set, um, set down for trial um, and, and be certified ready. Okay, so um, judicial case management means that the judge takes charge of the matter so that when they do appoint a judge um, at the date that is it's allocated, Parties are not going to go to court and fight over all those nonsense, those things that could have been sorted out before. This is now so that when we go to court, we know what it is that needs to be proved. We know what the facts are. We know all the evidence. We know what they're going to use. They know what we're going to use. We know what the expert is coming to say. We have experts. We've got joint minutes. Everything. And we, the issues has been so narrowed down to such an extent that court time is then less than, than having a protracted trial where we have to discover, discuss all of these nonsense and try and sort out all of these side issues. He didn't do that and she must still do that. That is why they have judicial case management. Okay, So the court will only um, issue a certificate of trial readiness if everything in the file is in order and the parties are still going to go ahead with the matter. Right. So just read what Rule 37A um, says. Um, and those of you that are practicing, you probably were at judicial case management um, hearings already because it's it's something that um, you don't argue the merits of the matter or that. You must just know that everything is ready in, in, in the file. And that is what you will tell the court. But... Um, yeah, I speak under correction. Candidate attorneys don't have right of appearance in the High Court, so they wouldn't do it. But attorneys can usually go and, with right of appearance in the High Court, go to the judicial case management hearing. Right, so that's that. Remember that um, I said right at the beginning that um, the judge can only consider evidence. Now, sometimes it's difficult to get evidence before the court because a witness may be reluctant or unwilling to give evidence that you can subpoena a witness but what if the witness is outside of the country then the court doesn't have any uh, a jurisdiction over that, that witness to force and compel him to give evidence so you can bring an application to take evidence on commission right this is now a commissioner is appointed the attorneys then go to the commissioner sorry they then go to where the witness is, where the commissioner and the court itself himself don't go, the commissioner, and then they do the, the evidence. So the examination in chief, the cross-examination and the re-examination, that evidence is then recorded and the commissioner will then certify that it's, it, that is the evidence that has been taken. And then it gets handed up and becomes part of the evidence of the court. Now, this was a... a um, this made more sense prior to us having all these, um, having been um, subject or having been doing Teams and um, Microsoft Teams and Zoom like we're doing now. Um, if a witness is in another country and he can't come to South Africa to give evidence, we know now that we can just do it virtually. I mean, we don't have to appoint a commissioner to go there and then that part the Everybody must go there because the court himself cannot go there. So, but it's still there. Um, now you can apply also for, for for virtual evidence of specific witnesses. But evidence on commission, still on the books, where the att attendance of a witness cannot be enforced, the court will, as a rule, allow the evidence to be taken on commission unless it appears that the other side is likely to be prejudiced thereby or that a miscarriage of justice may result. So in today's situation where we have um, Microsoft Teams and Zoom, we can just take the evidence. The judge can be in court and the attorneys can also be in court, but the witness can be online and we can still give evidence in court and not have a commissioner. But yeah, so um, you would bring an application for evidence on commission to be allowed. 
and then the judge um has its discretion it can be on contentious issue but more more formal issues is also and it must be satisfied that the evidence obviously is material and that the person is unable or unwilling to come and give evidence in court okay do i have any questions none Right, um, interrogatories is the same. Um, this is um, when a person is outside of the jurisdiction of the court um, in terms of Section 39 of the Superior Court Act, evidence by way of interrogatories. This is where a set of questions is then given to a commissioner to, to put to the witness and the answers are recorded. Um, it's also a possibility. But like I say, with us having had courts, um, how totally trials are on, held online, I don't think this would this would be necessary in all cases. Right, and evidence on affidavit, that is in the court's discretion. So um, we're dealing with trials and you call oral evidence, but sometimes parties would um, want evidence to go in on affidavit. That is when, say the evidence is the evidence presented by the plaintiff and the defendant is, but I'm not going to challenge this evidence. It's an affidavit. I don't have any cross-examination. In fact, I agree with this evidence. Then the parties can agree that the evidence by affidavit um, should go in. But it's still up to the court to decide whether he's going to accept that. So it's in the discretion of the court. Irrespective if the parties agree, the court can still say no, but this witness must come and testify in open court. Okay. Um, the courts are more disposed to allow, to allow it if evidence is of an isolated fact or of a more formal nature, then the court will allow evidence on affidavit to go in. And obviously, if it's not going to be challenged by the other party, the court would allow it. But it, um, even if the parties agree, the court still has the last say. Right, and then um, the pre-trial conference. This is now the pre-trial conference between the parties. Okay, now in terms of Rule 37, the parties must hold a pre-trial conference. Um, it's usually held at the offices of one of the um, attorneys. Sometimes it's even held in by counsel. All the parties must be um, represented. So the plaintiff must be represented and the defendant must be represented at this pre-trial conference. Um, the, did, uh, the plaintiff usually delivers a notice, but if the plaintiff doesn't deliver a notice, the defendant can also call for the pre-trial conference, right? Um, the pre-trial conference, um, a minute of the pre-trial conference must be signed and it must be filed um, at court. Um, I think it's now 25 days before the trial. Okay, so um, at the pre-trial conference, this is important, at the pre-trial conference, um, you must then discuss the following, and it's in your in your manual, and I'll, it's also in the rules. Um, rule 37, sub-rule 6, says the following, must be, the minute must reflect the following, okay? The minutes of the pre-trial conference shall be prepared and signed by or on behalf of every party and the following shall appear therefrom. Now, this is what you must discuss at the pre-trial conference. The date, the place, and the duration of the conference, and the names of the pr persons present. Right? If a party feels that such party is prejudiced because another party has not complied with the rules of the court, the nature of such non-compliance and the prejudice, so you will say that the defendant didn't do X, Y, and Z, and I have been prejudiced. You note it in the pre-trial minutes. Then, other matters regarding preparation of trial, which such party will raise for discussion. Sorry. Um, every party that um, parties have considered settlement, you will say that the parties have considered settlement, or the parties are still in the process of considering settlement, but you don't give the details of any settlement. You just say that settlement is being discussed. Um, you can say whether any issue has been referred 
um, for mediation, arbitration, or a decision by a third party and the basis on which it has been so referred. That is now an issue between the parties. Whether the case should be transferred to another court, you must address that. And also, mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Somebody speaking. Oh, it's not. Um, you must also say um, whether issues should be decided separately. So you can agree in the pre-trial conference whether issues should be decided separately. Or you just you, you you discuss it. If the one party says no, issues should not be decided separately. And the other one says, OK, issues should be decided separately. And then they can agree that you must bring an application to have the issues decided separately. Now, the issues decided separately. separately. Um, I think I got a question yesterday. It was um, with the special plea and the merits. Can it be heard separately? That is the issues being decided separately. So you can decide at the pre-trial conference whether you agree that the issues are going to be decided separately or if the other party must bring a court application to have the issues decided separately. You can, um, and, and it's not just special pleas and, and merits. Um, in, a, in a case of delict, um, if you remember first, before you go into the damages that was suffered and, and the amount of damages, you, the court must first um, determine if the defendant was negligent. Because if the court determines that the defendant was not negligent and didn't cause the damages, then there's no need for you to go and quantify the damages and go into the injuries and that, because it's not the defendant's fault. The defendant is before the court. So you can also separate the issues of um, liability and quantum, or as they say, merits and quantum. The liability issue can first be heard to determine whether the defendant is in fact liable. And then if the court decides, yes, the defendant is liable, then go into the damages that were suffered and, and the effects of the, that damages. So that is what you um, decide at the pre-trial conference. And then if there are any further admissions that, that the parties want to make at this stage and um, disputes regarding the duty to begin or the onus of proof. Now, the duty to begin is usually um, with a person who has the onus of proof. Now, um, we know the rule, you alleges must prove, but in some instances, the defendant must start first. Those of you who do um, labor law, you know that if there's an unfair dismissal and the dismissal is not in dispute, parties agree that the applicant was in fact dismissed, then the defendant must then go first because he must then now prove that the dismissal was fair. Exactly also the same if in the case of an unlawful arrest. If the defendant said, yes, I arrested Mr. X, then the defendant must prove that the arrest was lawful. So he goes first. He has the duty to begin. So it's not necessarily the, in all cases that the plaintiff has the duty to begin. In some cases, the defendant goes first. And that you also sort out at the at the um, pre-trial conference. And then any agreement regarding the production of proof by way of affidavit, if you're going to agree to an affidavit going in, or where the evidence is required to be taken on commission or by way of audiovisual link in terms of Rule 38. So you can see there they've made provision for this audiovisual for the virtual evidence. And um, agreement on that and which party will be responsible for the copying and the preparation of the documents. It usually is the plaintiff, so they would come to an agreement. They would say the plaintiff will be responsible for the um, copying and the preparation of the documents, but then they would add that if the defendant wishes to add anything, he must amend it. So just to cover the plaintiff if if things are not in order that the defendant undertook to, to do that. And then which um, documents or copies of documents will further without proof serve as evidence of what they purport to be, which extracts may be proved without proving the whole document or any other agreement regarding the proof of documents. That must also list down. Um, yeah, and the minute must be filed not, less than, not later than 25 days prior to the trial date. And if you are late with filing your minute, you lose your trial date. And they are very strict with that. 
So it, it, if the plaintiff don't call the pre-trial conference, the defendant can. And then they have the pre-trial conference. And these days, people have pre-trial conferences online also. So they have the pre-trial conference. Um, this, the agenda is sent out. All of these items are listed. And then they go through each and every item and record the answers. And then the plaintiff usually prepares the minute, send it to the defendant to sign. And he signs it. And then the plaintiff files it not less than 25 days before the trial. Uh, yes. Um, advocate, please. Yes. Uh, please, this pre-trial conference, will it be the order of the court or the choosing of the the, the parties? Um, you, the venue of it. Uh, no, I mean, is it the choice of the parties or the order it's of compulsory. the It's compulsory. It's compulsory to have a pre-trial minute. You already have your trial date now to have, sorry, to have a pre-trial conference and it's compulsory to file a pre-trial minute. You've already had the trial, uh, the, 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 pre, the judicial pre-trial. You've now mm -hmm. received your court date. So not mm -hmm. less than two weeks. So the parties must then come together and apply their minds to all the issues again. So, and you will see from there, you can even, even further narrow down the issues because now we visit it again and we talk to each other about certain stuff. So that is the purpose. And then we file the minutes. So mm -hmm. it is it is compulsory to have a pre-trial conference between the parties and it is compulsory to file the pre-trial minutes and it mustn't be filed less than 25 days um, before the trial. Okay. So my question is, uh, is it the choice of the court is that the order of the court of the or the rule of the court or the choice? It's of a the... rule. Okay. It's a rule. It's mm. a rule 37. It's in terms of rule 37 that you must, you are required to have a pre-trial conference in terms of the rule. It's compulsory. Thank so you. it is it is it is the rules of the court. Yeah. So the uh, um sometimes if you had it long before. And the matter mm. was postponed and you already filed a pre-trial minute, the court will expect you to have another pre-trial minute closer to the trial, at least um 25 days before the trial. Because the court will say you had it last time when you came to were coming to court, you had a pre-trial conference, but a year has passed, you must have another one. Yeah. Because that pre-trial minute is old, because maybe things have changed. Mm. So it's different from the the one the call. Um, is it the one they call before the, the 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 court could even start in session? Because there are, there are issues you don't the case does not start first. People have to meet before the trial. Yes, people must meet before the trial. Parties must be represented at the pre-trial conference. I see that you, Luria, Mary, and Daisy has lost me. Um, can you hear me now, Iluria? Iluria, I see, and I, I, I'm just read it now. I see you sent it off post seven already. Yes, checking. Ch um, Sibanda, Oba King. Sorry, not checking. Oba King. Yes. You may yes. proceed. Yes. Um. May I ask, um, which one comes first between the pre-trial and the judicial case management in terms of Rule 37A? Which one comes first? Okay. The judicial case management is so that the matter can be certified ready so that you can get a trial date. Yes. When you have the pre-trial conference, you remember you must file the pre-trial minute 25 days before the trial date. So you already have the trial date by then, which logically, if we look at it, the judicial case management comes first. But sometimes people have a pre-trial conference before the judicial case management, and then they have another pre-trial conference after. They can have as many as, as is necessary. Sometimes people have it before because you can file it um, not less than 25 days, but it can be months before. So Sometimes people would have a pre-trial conference before and there would be a pre-trial minute. Um, or sometimes the judge may even say at the judicial case management, the parties must have a pre-trial conference so that they can narrow down the issues further. But yeah. So, so, so according to the rules, um, 
it's, it's, uh, you have a pre-trial conference after having the, the court date. No, 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 it doesn't say you must have it after the court date. It just says that the minute must be filed 25 days before the trial, which presumes that you have the court date. But you can have it even before you have the court date also. You can call a pre-trial conference just to see where the other one is going with the matter so that the parties can speak about the matter. Like it's a round yeah. table, a round table where parties then speak about the matter. But yes. it's before the trial, so it's a pre-trial conference. But the minute must be filed not less than 25 days before the trial date. And if the minute is filed too long before the trial date, the court might even say that you must have another pre-trial conference because that minute is too old. Things might have changed in the interim. Yes, because um, I'm asking this question. Um, I don't know if the 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 rules in the magistrate court assess the rules in the, the court in this regard because in most uh, magistrate courts they adopted the practice of having the pretrial before the case management uh, before the magistrate uh, so the the case management uh, before the magistrate will be informed by the the, the pretrial minutes like whatever okay. that will be decided on the pretrial uh, conference uh, will inform uh, the the case management before the judicial case management before the magistrate. So she he will, she will ask you that uh, whether you 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 held your your pre trial the party party and party pre trial conference. She will ask those questions before certifying the matter. I I hear what you say. Um, yeah. like I say, this uh, doesn't say which one comes first. And 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 at the at the judicial pre pre trial before judge before the matter has even been allocated, they will also ask did the parties meet. They would sometimes ask did the parties have a pre trial conference yet. Although your pre trial minute is not yet supposed, it's not yet com compulsory for it to be in the file because it must only be in the file twenty five days. Then then you're late. So at that stage you can't be late, but they can advise you or they can encourage you to have a pre trial conference. Before All then. Right. All right, thank you. Okay. Yes, I'm I'm still looking for you, Luria, Mary, and Daisy, who said she lost me. I'm concerned. It was around 7:33. Did anybody lose me at that time also? Man, so, can I maybe ask a question just uh, out of interest? Joachim. Yes, Taliyar. I just want to find out quickly, how long do you have to be a practicing attorney or an advocate to know all of the stuff by heart? Or are you always going to refer back to notes and books because yo, it's a lot of information. You know it changes as we go along. <laughs> so even if you even if you know it today, tomorrow you find out, no, but I don't know that. I, I, it's, it's now changed. So you've, you've chosen this profession, you're going to be a lifelong learner. You're going to do our work every day. So, <laughs> so, we, so we don't have to feel insecure if we can't remember all of the stuff. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's just that you, you, you've you got your rules and you know this must be done, this must be done. And, and um, I mean, I think after two a year or so, you know, I must have a pre come. You know you must discover. You, you Those things are, yeah, and you just check your rules. But, but like I say, the rules change as to how, and then they come with practice directives, and, and then you must do things differently in different divisions. So you must always read and check. And what, you, is, um, what is so convenient today is the social platforms. There are some, um, a lot of these um, WhatsApp groups with lots of attorneys in it where if, they, if somebody's just struggling, they just quickly pose a question and then some other person who knows and deals with that quickly answers, this is what you do, this is the procedure there. So I think we're better off than, than what people before us because we have all those assistance, I think, especially with, with, with the procedures as to how to do it and how do you get that and phone numbers of people and things. There's, there's always that kind of help. Um, on the social platform. So I would encourage that you do join. There's a lot of it out there. Attorneys um, platforms where they really give assistance to each other with regards to to that. Okay, and yeah. now I can go sleep peacefully. Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
OK, and somebody says they are very stressed about the attorney's admissions exam. So much content and such a broad scope. Yes, it is a broad scope and they don't narrow it down for you. Eh? But I mean, you do know that there's a lot of attorneys out there who passed it. And what do they have that you don't have? Just think of it like that. How could they have passed it? So you can also pass it. It's not it's not that difficult. What is the difference? Oh, I'm sorry, what is the fundamental purpose of a Rule 37 pre-trial conference? It's to try and reach agreement on certain issues, usually of a more formal nature, which will eliminate the need to call certain witnesses and have the effect of shortening the duration of the trial and thereby conserve costs. It's also to agree other formal procedural issues, example, the onus of proof, the duty to begin, preparation of bundles of documents, separation of issues, which will enable the trial to run smoothly, avoid arguments in limine, and allow the parties to concentrate on the merits of the dispute. Yeah, that is the fundamental purpose of the pre-trial conference. Right, and then you get to the final preparation. At this stage, you can brief an advocate if your client can afford it. Um, an advocate to give you advice on the evidence. You now have all, you have the facts that is contained in the pleadings. You have all the documentary evidence. You know what they're going to say. You have the expert's opinions. You can give all of that to an advocate then to go and research the law and apply to give you an opinion as to how the law would probably now the case would probably be determined in court and then you can decide whether you still have a good case or if you're going um, to settle uh, or whatever. Yes. Sorry, advocate. Sorry, um, I must have missed it somewhere. Um, just a quick one. If um, once the minute has been submitted um, before the trial date and during the trial, it therefore becomes evident that um, something that was agreed to in the minute is now in dispute um, and requires um, a point in limine to be raised. Um, what happens then? Is, is, is the minute binding on the parties and the admissions made there? Are they binding? Or... Yes, they are. They um, are. OK, so what, what happens when a dispute of fact, which was agreed to, um, in the minute then pops up during the trial and it requires a point in limine to be raised or something else or an interlocutory application. Yes, um, if if a, if a, um, admission is made during the pre-trial, because that is one of the topics that must be discussed, one of the points of the agenda, if an admission is made during the pre-trial, you are bound by that admission. That is why you don't make admissions if you don't have instructions to make that admission from your client. Because you are you can be held bound by that and then later on the court may not allow you to retract. And if it is future that I look, you can try and bring an application that you must be allowed to amend the minute. But whatever is decided in the minute, that that is um it's part of the pleadings because. This is now, otherwise they're just paying lip service to it and, and, and no, not taking it serious. So um, there is a reported court case. I'm trying to think of the name and I can't. I know it begins with a K and that's where my brain stops. Um, it's this where a state attorney in a pre-trial conference made an admission and he made it incorrectly because at the trial he, he said, but he shouldn't have made that admission. And the court said, no, you are bound by that. So there's a decided court case that deals exactly with your with your question. And yes, you are bound by whatever you have said in the pre-trial conference. Um, okay, okay, thanks. Okay. Um, would would the presiding officer um, have some form of judicial discretion to allow the amendment or? Yes, if you apply then, for it. And yeah, mm -hmm. and then if if it surfaces that well, actually, um, that application should not have been brought in any event because um, you lose that dispute of fact. Well, then uh, costs uh, be, cost be 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 awarded for the for the for the wastefulness of um, that that particular application. Now look, this is all in, within the discretion of the court. 
So you can argue exactly what you're saying. You can argue your point, but it is in the discretion of the court whether he's going to give a punitive cost order because of that, um, yeah, of you persisting with that way, it's not admitted. Or the court can say, but it, look, um, he didn't know and it was necessary for him to put it in dispute. That's why I allowed it. Um, it depends. But, uh, the court always has the discretion. I mean, you can't say the court can't do anything. And the court, the, it's up to the court. And, and you, it's also, you can always try to persuade the court. So, in, uh, to decide in a certain, in a certain, in, in your favor. And, okay. and, and if you are on the other side, you would argue for your favor. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yes, um, yes. Can parties reach a settlement agreement during the pre-trial conference? Yes, because one of the things that you have to discuss is that you are discussing settlement and even at pre-trials and a lot of matters are actually settled at pre-trial. Yeah, you can. Okay. You can reach You can reach a settlement anytime, sir. Um, can release a settlement any time. Any other questions? I'm just typing the name. I found the case um, for that gentleman. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no other questions on that. Um, yes, we, we're still going to do settlements. Um, 2010. I think you can get it on on um, case lines. That is the case where the court decided, and it's a Supreme Court of Appeal case, that um, in the pre-trial conferences you've made an admission, you are bound by it. Right. Um, okay, so now you... Oh, oh, oh there was a question on... on um, somebody asked about Dukas Tekum. Um, that is when you request the party to come to court with a document. Now, like I said, this is not a, a document that your opponent has, because remember, your opponent must discover any edit or document that he has or had that was relevant. But if there's a witness that has a document in his position that is relevant to the trial, you issue a sub subpoena to Kastekum. Now, just to give you an example of, of where this would fit in to make it more clear to you. Um, say, for example, um, the person has a company, right? And um, maybe they um, they are married outside of community of property and the, the estate, um, you want to claim, yeah, you want to, in terms of the accrual, with the accrual and you want to, you want to say that the person's estate is bigger and you don't know the details of the company, the person is maybe a shell in a company of another family member. And in order for you to get that information, then you would then send a subpoena to Kastakum to the accountant to come to court with the necessary financial statements and shareholding certificates of the company. You see, the opponent doesn't, doesn't have that in his position, so he don't have to discover it. But you can request that that comes to court. That is subpoena to Kastakum. That is the best I can do with that explanation. I hope it... Um, it has answered you. Yes, right. thank you. Thank you. Okay, sure. Right, consultation with your own witnesses should be thorough. This is now your lay witnesses, say. Eh? Um, with the with the expert witness, you usually um you have what is going to say a report, and you must give a summary of what is going to say to your opponent. And obviously, the expert must be an expert. So you're going to first, if you call an expert witness, you first place on the record the qualifications and the experience and in why. Should this person then be declared an expert? Your opponents can also say, but this person is not an expert, and then you can make argue over that also. If you appointed somebody who's not an expert. But talking about lay witnesses, um, you consult with your own witness. Your consultations must be thorough. You mustn't tell the witness what to say, and you shouldn't groom the evidence to sound good and be a party to distorting evidence. 
But obviously, you're going to prepare your witness to the best of your ability, listen to his evidence, and maybe make suggestions as to how he should say it, and maybe um, take him through possible cross-examination questions that he might expect, so that it's not the first time that he hears um, yeah, these questions and that he's challenged. You prepare your witnesses to the best um, way possible. It is permissible for legal practitioners to take statements from proposed witnesses, but they say as a rule, you should not take down an affidavit. Um, the reason for that is that an affidavit is evidence under oath. And if um, you as a legal practitioner, remember, you have a duty towards the court. If you are in possession of an affidavit where the witness says something different, you have a duty towards the court. I know you have a duty towards your client also. But you also have a duty towards the court as an officer of the court. So rather not let your, your witness make an affidavit, um, if you take down his evidence, rather have it in a statement form. So if he contradicts, it's not that you have evidence that is contradicting what he's saying in court. It's just to protect yourself more or less. Right. You can also consult with your opponent's witnesses in civil matters. Um, where the trial has already started, but before the witness testified, you just give notice to your opponent that you want to speak to his use or her lay witnesses. Um, the opponent may not be present. If you object, you may still consult. If the trial has already started and the witness is finished testifying, again, you must give adequate, adequate notice to your opponent and the opponent may be present. If you object, you may still consult. The objection to you consulting is no impediment. You are allowed to consult with your opponent's witnesses civil matters right now i've dealt with separation from the issues um I've, I've said this is one of the aspects one of the agenda items that you discussed during your your pre-trial conference um basically it's just it's it's rule 33 for those of you who are following the rules if a question of law or fact may conveniently be adjudicated before evidence is led the issues can be separated OK, so like I said, um, special plea and the merits, um, negligence and the quantum of the damages or so liability and quantum. If, if a question of law or fact may conveniently be adjudicated, you can and then you can bring in, you can agree to that during the pre-trial conference. Or if, you, if there's no agreement that is being reached as to whether you're going to uh, separate it or not, um, if the one party wants it to be separated, you can bring a substantive application. Sometimes plaintiffs are reluctant to have the issue separated, um, especially in delictual matters, because um, you wait two years or so for a court date. So if the one part is heard and then he has to go back in the queue to get the date for the for the quantum part. So um, there's going to be a big time lapse and that is not beneficial to plaintiffs. So sometimes they insist that the whole matter is being, you prepare for the whole matter. <clears throat> and sometimes the defendant say, yeah, but what if, if I pr I'm not negligent? Um, why must I incur unnecessary cost and appoint all these people? Mm. And have all these witnesses ready when I might not even use them or call them. Because experts ask um, standby fees if they are, are supposed to give evidence on a specific day. Right. Um, you will see if you look at Rule 33, it also talk about this, uh, um, a stated case. Now, parties, um, a state, what a stated case is, is that parties agree on the facts. So if, if there's no dispute as to the facts, if it was a, a motor vehicle accident and we agree that the motor vehicle accident happened like this and, yeah. Say, for example, um, and, and we agree on the injuries that were sustained. There's no, the person's um, leg was broken. There's no, there's no fight about that. But we basically just agree on a minor issue. We can do a stated case where we state all the facts that we agree on. And we then just address the court, maybe on the quantum, if we disagree on that, on, 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 on the amount. We say maybe this person will never be able to work again, and we, we're not fighting over that. We agree on that. But we say if the person had worked but for the accident, he would have earned um, 
so much and then you say no, but you would have earned so much and then you fight over that in court and you just argue that part. But the stated case, so all of the evidence is basically already before the court because there's no dispute on that. Right, any questions on that? No. Okay, um, I'm moving on. The court, yes. Um, I've noticed that you're drinking some liquid water because of your voice. We are really tired. It's a lot of information. Will it be proper to break now for the evening? Are you so tired? Well, how do you notice I'm drinking water? I heard that. Something. Hey? No, it's, hey? it's jealous. Just one question, advocate. <laughs> yes. No, I'm just worried. Can you see me? <laughs> just one I question. Heard it. I heard a tingling sound of water. Okay. <laughs> If parties question. agree, if parties agree on on the facts, but differ on the question of law, they can have a stated case. Because they can have a stated case. Okay. Then they just argue the law, but they oh. agree on all the facts because then you don't. It's unnecessary to call all that witness to put the facts before the court because there's no dispute. But okay. but the application of the law that they will argue then. Okay. okay. And that is in terms of Rule 33. Okay, so um, there's three minutes left. I'm just going to do this one slide. Um, we've already talked about this, and so I'm just going to repeat it. Um, this is one of the aspects also that you discussed during the pre-trial conference, the preparation of the court papers. It is a duty of the plaintiff's attorney to arrange, paginate, and bind together all the papers and to deliver a complete index of at least five days before the hearing. And failure may cause the court to strike the case from the roll. Okay, so then you, and striking it from the roll doesn't mean your claim is dismissed. It just means it's off that role, and now you must go back in the queue, back in the role, and get a court date. And then um, in some divisions, they even have in their practice directives, if your matter has been struck from the role because of non-appearance or non-compliance with the rule, the attorney must then depose to an affidavit and um, explain why that was so and what happened. So they don't make it easy for attorneys then not to comply with the rules before you can be allowed to have the matter set down again. But um, yeah, indexes and that, that would be your baby. If you're a candidate attorney, they usually have you do the pagination and the binding together and the indexes and uh, bundles, different bundles, depending on how big the court bundle is. Right, I think now I can stop. <clears throat> um, good evening, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow is our last night. Is it? Yes. Mm. And that's Thank you, advocates. I'm, yeah, I'm still concerned about the lady who said she lost me um, at yeah. 7.33. Is she back? Iluria? I Iluria? think she lost you the content, not the connection. But, but I mean, I want to hear from her what it is. And she's not answering. I've spoken, I've asked before also. Miss Daisy? Or Mrs. Stacy, she's not here. Yeah. Oh, there's a hand. Yes. Yes, advocate. On this last slide, um, when you are saying that uh, the duty of the plaintiff to prepare and pagination documents, is it in, uh, is this the normal practice, or is it governed by a certain uh, rule? Yeah, it's at sixty-five, I think. Um, I speak under correction. I'll check for you now, but it's yeah. it's yeah it's it's, it's at sixty four or sixty five. I'm not not sure, but it's in terms of a rule. It's not just um make up stuff. It's in terms of a rule. Um, oh, okay. rule sixty two. Is it sixty two? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in terms of a rule. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Just one thing, heads of argument, where does that come in, if I may ask? Um, in, 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 in civil, in, in actions, it comes right at the end, after you've now presented your evidence, 
and um, the court may ask written heads of argument. Okay. And in, 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 in applications, in notice of motion, um, heads of argument comes after the close of plea, after the um, re replying affidavit, the third affidavit. And if you set the matter down, then the, the applicant first filed his or her heads and then the respondent filed heads also. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can. It's now 31. Evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. Good evening. Bye bye. Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Good night, advocate. Good night. You know your stuff, advocate. Good night. <laughs> yeah.